Let's do this. It's time for Hanging with Langan. I like that she's got a big, dirty mouth that gets her in trouble. Wow. Stop me because I'm having a good time. Well, hello, my cherubs. Welcome to Hanging with Langan, the official Hanging with Langan Bell. Oh, my God. I am so excited. We have a double header today. I'm Marilyn Dash. I went to high school with her. She is a pilot, and she's going to join me in just a moment. There's so much to talk about uh, women in aviation. A lot's happening on the national level to get women involved in aviation. So they say. She knows all the dirt on that. And then following that, I have a woman named Beth Dolan joining me. She is a film director, and she has a really, really important and powerful film called A Stranger at Home, and it's about the lack of care for our veterans uh, in their mental health. It's really fascinating stuff, and it's important stuff, and you better listen. Um, don't make me hit you with a wooden spoon. But first, all my shows here on Hanging with Langan, you know that they are free. I bring my gifts and talents to you <laughs> at no charge. But what we are doing, too, if you uh, are so inclined, we're doing a uh, pay what you can at PayPal or Venmo at Mo Langan, just pay what you can, chuck a buck, whatever. Uh, keep me from getting a blind dog and sitting on a street corner at a red light. That's all, that's all we're doing here. Um, and please consider joining Patreon. You get all the backstage chats and I'll get you Don't Make Me Hate You t-shirt at a certain level. And you can also get the Don't Make Me Hate You t-shirts, masks, all that at MaureenLangan.com. Uh, I have to show you something. Look what my niece made me. She's a freshman at the University of Pittsburgh and she, uh, embroiders, I guess it's like Little House on the Prairie, uh, but she's really talented and she made me a Hanging with Lang, an official tote. And she does caps and sneakers and base, all of it, denim, jackets. So go check out her work at Sophisticated, get it? Abby Lang and Sophisticated on Instagram. Gotta support the gals uh, working hard. All right. So we're going to take your comments. We want to hear from you today. And if you're watching on the Hanging with Langan Facebook page, what I would like you to do, please, so that everybody, so we can see your name attached to your comments, go to StreamYard.com forward slash Facebook, click on the blue button, and then we will see your name and share this, please. That's all I ask of you. Please share this so that people can watch. That's how we build the numbers. That's how we get people involved in the show. So it's up to you. All right, now, what child did not grow up knowing about Amelia Earhart? I did. Did you not? Of course you did. And you know, I read that she was born in 1897. She was born in 1897. And she disappeared in 1937. Nobody knows where she is. I don't understand this. Like anybody find Amelia Earhart for the love of God. So earlier this month, the Senate designated March 8th through 14th as Women of the Aviation Workforce Week. It's bipartisan, mind you. Wow. wow. Oh, ding, ding, ding. Something bipartisan in government. Woohoo! All right. And um, it honors women on planes in the skies. And they have committed to helping increase the number of women in aviation and, of course, as well as STEM job opportunities. And this surprised me. Women comprise 50% of the population, but only 8% roughly of pilots. Why, Christina? Why? Well, here to tell us why and more about aviation is Marilyn Dash, <laughs> pilot. Hello, Hi, Maureen. How are you? I'm good. I'm glad you're here hanging with me. Me too. You have been a pilot. You started late as in the pilot yes. world. Yeah. I um, started flying when I was 37 years old. Actually, on my 37th birthday, I took my first flight lesson. And like, what precipitated that? You were just like, I got to do this? Interesting story. I was driving up the freeway in, I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time. And I was driving uh, up the 101, people will know it, that live there. And <laughs> there was a new aviation museum going in at the San Carlos Airport that volunteers needed. And I had a big love of uh, obviously sciences, but I also had a big love of history. And I thought this would be a great place for me to learn about aviation history and World War II history and all of these other things. So I went to, um, I walked in and introduced myself and I have a, a, a couple of talents that were needed at the time. I Such have, as, um, you tell. I can listen really well and transcribe things quickly. So I followed the, uh, it was the Heller Aviation Museum, and I, I followed Stan Hiller around while he told me things about the airplanes. 
This is the um, the historical significance of this is blah blah blah. The, this is um, from 1937, and it was built in this, and this is why it's important to aviation history. And I would just sit there and write down everything he said, you know, verbatim. And I helped develop some of the um, docent manuals and things so that the uh, people who came after me, some of the volunteers, would be able to learn more about some of the things that he told me. And every day he would sit down and tell me, why aren't you a pilot? And I'm like, oh, one of these days. Why aren't you a pilot? I'm like, uh, one of these days. And finally, one of these days showed up and I was 37, walked into the local flight school and said, I want to become a pilot. Let me ask you this because, you know, we talked about aviation history week, which is cool, but for women, but why are the numbers so low? Actually, I think it's lower than you mentioned. I think it's in the 5% range, 5 to 6%. And I think that one of the things that women are, they don't want to get their hands dirty and flying is not a clean sport. I mean, it's just not. Um, you need to learn how to do, you need to have to, I've packed um, bearings in my tires. I've changed the oil. I've, you know, changed my spark plugs. Things you know, like that, that women don't just don't, we just don't learn that as kids. You know, men ah. kind of do, but we need. So I think that one of the ways to get women involved is to get them it, it, earlier. Like, let's teach them earlier that um, how machines work, how cars work, how airplanes work, how what that means. Like, what? Why is there oil in a in an engine? You know, why is the what? What do all these things pieces mean, and how do we get them okay, to I see work what together? You're saying. Because I was going to say, well, there's plenty of women who don't mind getting their hands dirty and, and right. working hard. But what you're saying is it starts at a young age where you know, maybe you're teaching your son how to change oil in the car, but not your daughter. Right. Absolutely. And I, I I didn't know it. I didn't, you know, the lefty, loosey, righty, tidy. I didn't know that until I was like 40 years old. Or Well, now I, know. I, know. I, I, love I mean, you know, and it's something I should use every day, but I never, you know, even when you're putting the, the faucet on outside to water the plants, you know, like righty tight. Oh, there you go. But it's something that is ingrained in people when they just start, grow up with mechanical things, but we just never learned that. Well, I did go fishing with my brothers and my father, but I hated catfish. It, I just didn't like when I caught a cat. I'm like, all right, somebody else get the freaking catfish off the line. But I would, I had no problem with the worms. Um, it's so funny. Well, you know what too, uh, one of my brothers, uh, my daughter, my niece who, um, uh, Embroidered the hanging with Langan tote. A beautiful tote. She's, she's so good. She's so talented. Fun, heart, smart. That's our logo here. She um, is studying uh, architecture. And my brother had her redo her bedroom, learn where the studs go, learn what you need to do in the, in the flooring and how you. Right. And then she did how to put in the lighting. But so he like, wanted, how does it all fit together? Like, right. You know what I mean? That's really where the, the point comes in. So, okay, um, so you're talking about it and you also talk about, I've read some articles, you've written a bunch of articles on this about women also, girls needing mentors. Yes, and I think that they're almost afraid to ask for them. Like men just ha seem to uh, just garner uh, mentors, you know, like the coach and the, the high school coach or the shop teacher or, mm -hmm. you know, the neighbor down the street who's rebuilding a GTO or something. They just kind of like gravitate to it. But women don't seem to do that. And I don't think that older women like myself, we don't reach out to young girls as often. And so one of the things that I did is when I was uh, at the Reno Air Races, I raced for almost 15 years there. And I would, um, I had people donate Barbies that were barnstorming Barbie, air race, bar I mean, Air Force Barbie, astronaut Barbie, all these aviation themed Barbie dolls. And I would have the girls, if they would pay attention and answer the questions that, I, you know, that they, I talked to them about the airplane, if they could answer the questions, I'd give them a, a present of the, the aviation themed Barbie. And I kept one of each for myself, for my Barbie collection. Okay. Let me tell you this. My Irish mother would not let me play with Barbies growing up. I wasn't allowed to play with them. Uh, if they had it in aviation themed Barbie, it would be perfect. Right. Or right behind me, I have a Rosa Parks Barbie. I had no idea they made a Rosa Parks Barbie, but somebody- They gave didn't me. when we were young. No. They do now. Right? Of course exactly. now. Because when I was growing up, my mother's like, I don't want to play in with a doll with them boobs. It's not right for a little girl to play with dolls with boobs. I mean, you know, Irish Catholic. But um, 
you used to race or you do race? Talk to me about I that. raced for uh, about 15 years and it's uh, I was a biplane racer in the picture that was on the front cover is of me in my race plane. And um, let's show the covers. Maureen Langan's okay. prepared. I do my own tech. Look at that. There she is. How cool. I love that. Picture. Everybody laughs at my um, my sunglasses. I still have those sunglasses. <laughs> well, you have to be chic in the skies, Marilyn Dash. I think it's so. Come on. You never know who you might meet. I don't know who's up there. But, um, so so I, I raced up until 2017. And for the past few years, I've been uh, doing the announcing. So I'm the girl with the, I do the internet feed, the live internet feed of the races. And I do um, the live uh, in front of the crowd as well. So, so I go back and forth between the booth. That sounds way cool. So if people want to follow you, they can go to uh, Instagram, Marilyn.dash, Twitter, dash or four. And uh -huh. Facebook Dash for Life Coaching, which we'll get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. But that must be exciting to how do people like find out about you post it on your social media when you're gonna do these races or voice them or yeah. do the, well, the race we have uh, the Reno Air Races is always in September. Of course, we skipped last year for the COVID, but um we're we're back again this September. It's usually the second weekend in September. And uh up, I, when I was racing, you know, we had 150, 200,000 people would show up for the last weekend of the races. It's a week long event. It's huge here in the Reno uh, Tahoe area. And then um, we are putting on races. We're working on a race in Texas. I've been to um, China. I've been to Wuhan, China to put on the first air race ever in, in uh, China. And uh, Yep, of all people. Take their um, mind off of things over there in Wuhan, you know? Like well, this was before. This was before oh, they had the troubles. So, really um, nice. but my team, my group, uh, the International Formula One group is, uh, oh, we've right? done. What is it called? Done, it's an International Formula One air racing, pylon air racing. We do, we've done races in Spain, Tunisia, Thailand, China, and we're putting on, uh, we're looking at doing like a uh, United States tour. And where's Amelia? Does anybody know where Amelia no, is? No, no. Somewhere in South Pacific, I... sitting on an island. Freaking Amelia. Sipping a Mai Tai. So... It's it just, it was so, you know, she was such a great um, uh, image for the women to say, oh, look, an aviator. And then the loss of her, yeah. you know, when she disappeared, it was just like, you know, the, the wind went out of the sails. Because back in that day, the women were just starting to really get into uh, racing and flying and, you know, Poncho Barnes and, and all the others of that era. Um, I don't know Poncho. You should. You'd I'm, like Poncho. Poncho Barnes. I got to check Poncho out. Well, when I was growing up, I did love those strong women like Amelia mm -hmm. Earhart. I mean, <clears throat> just fascinating. And, you know, she was born in 1897. And the numbers of women haven't really grown that much nope. since she was born. Nope. So the Reno air races have been going on since 1964. In that, the, in the number of years that they've been racing, I was number 17 of all the women who raced there. 17 women um, raced up till when I started in 2003. And since then, I think we've got, I think 11 more women have raced since I started. So the numbers are increasing, but the first time a woman ever raced um, at Reno she was in the biplane class, which is the one that I raced in initially. And they made her wear ballast because she was so much more tight, like tinier than some of the other racers. They made her wear what? They made ballast. They put 50 pound weights in her plane so that it was fair because <laughs> she was a tiny little thing. Yeah. But they, yeah, they weren't, um, they weren't all that excited about having a woman join the team. Well, what is pylon? You gotten better. Pylon racing. So do you know how NASCAR has like an oval? Well, we basically fly an oval with, we do eight planes at a time and we fly an oval in the sky and our pylons are 50 foot uh, telephone poles with the 55 oh, gallon perfect. drums on top. Got it. So got we it. fly I'm around thinking, them. Mm -hmm. I thought it might've been a name of a type of plane. Forgive my ignorance. I don't know this world, which is why you're here. I don't know yours. <laughs> Pylon in the sky. We kind of do. You're doing the color commentary. She's racing now. She has 50 pound weights on each side. She's a slight mm -hmm. little thing. Keeping up right. with the masses. In sky, so, so smiling. Well, I, I know a gal, Lisa Johnson. She fought. She does racing, and I, I've talked to her about that, and I find her very interesting. Well, here's the deal: we have a mutual friend we went to high school with, and her daughter very much wants to uh, be a pilot. Now, Amelia Earhart was married to a big publishing magnet, so you know they had a few bucks to throw around. Right. How does a young woman today, 
or a 37 year old woman who may not have the financial means. Like it's expensive, isn't it? To become a pilot. Right. Yes. Oh yes. Um, so yeah, that's where most of my money goes to. So um, what I would recommend is to look into, there's an organization called the 99s, which is the one that was um, started by Amelia Earhart in her, in her era. It's called the 99s. And they have um, that organization and the Women in Aviation group, they both have uh, scholarships that they can apply for. Local groups, um, you know, your local airport might have uh, a, a Women in Aviation type uh, scholarship, and she should just apply for those. And uh, there's always the option of the military. You know, there's always, they love women pilots right about now. So, you know, we're finally broke that glass ceiling and we're, um, we're increasing ranks with them. But um, if she wants to stay civilian, I would look into those types of scholarships. Thank you. That's really helpful. That's very mm -hmm. helpful. And is there an age limit? Well, the, there's not an age limit, right? No. I, there's a young limit like you can't you can't solo an airplane until you're 16 or 17 years old or whatever which i didn't have to worry about that limit but the top limit there's uh the, the worst thing is the insurance uh, requirements so as you're you know a 90 year old pilot might have to pay a little bit more in insurance so, i think um yeah. my guest is pilot marilyn dash and this and earlier this month march it was designated there was a week by the senate uh, designated a women in aviation to bring more awareness to that, as well as STEM and get women into uh, fields that they haven't typically been uh, welcomed fully into or, or thought that they could. It's all such bullshit to me. Anyway, um, Marilyn, please stand by. Uh, we're going to come back in one moment. This is Maureen Lankett's commercial break. And then we will uh, find out like what, the first time she went in the sky alone. I want to know Ooh. if she almost puked in a corner. I got to know all of this. But you can't puke in the sky. I'll come back. Don't spit into the wind. Jim Croce told me that. All right, stand by, please. Ma Marilyn, we'll be right back. Okay, so Marilyn, we're going to have more with her. And also coming up. Uh, on the half an hour, on the half hour, we will have Beth Dolan, who is a filmmaker, a really powerful documentary uh, called Stranger at Home about how the military men and women are just freaking forgotten when it comes to their mental health. It's three vets, three generations and three different wars, whistleblowers and the, the poor guy who accidentally uh, shot Pat Tillman. I mean, this is like heart-wrenching stuff. And you know, here at Hanging with Lang and we, we, fun, heart, smart, that's what we try to bring together here. And by we, I mean me. And, you know, everybody from academics to alcoholics are welcome. I bring in comedians and I bring in pilots and filmmakers because I want to bring you, I, I combine my broadcasting background with the uh, humor of a comedian. At least we, that's the goal. But all the shows are free and I also, you know, there is a pay what you can option at paypal.me at Molangan and Venmo at Molangan. These just keep the shows going, the, you know, the updates. There's a lot of tech. Believe me, my head's exploding. And you can also go to MaureenLangan.com, get a Don't Make Me Hate You t-shirt because <laughs> you don't want to hate people. They make you hate them. You're a victim. Um, <laughs> or victim. So not a victim. Um, <clears throat> but I just love wearing it in the mask. You went to the supermarket, like, Don't Make Me Hate You. Very funny stuff. Uh, also, I do Patreon, which is a really cool thing. It's subscriber based and starting at five bucks a month, you get all the videos. Uh, you get all the videos and at 10, you'll get the backstage a dirt. Believe me, some comics have told me some like, wow, dirt that I've even been like, are you kidding? Delicious. Uh, so stuff like that. And then at higher levels, we do some public speaking coaching or comedy show or wine party. So different things like that. If you are apt to uh, support the show. And, uh, oh, we got a shout out. You can't spell Venmo without Mo. Damn straight. <laughs> Uh, I knew what you meant. Um, all right. So I'm going to bring back my guest pilot, Marilyn Dash, who I went to high school with. All right, you. We Dash. did, didn't we? Good times. It was good times. I, I enjoyed myself. Did you get in trouble in high school at all? No, I was too good. A little bit of trouble, but on like on the side. But I had one of those fathers that used to teach us how to get out of trouble. Oh, really? Any, yeah. any hints for anyone? My father would tell us we were, um, if you remember downtown on Breverwick, the oh, food town. Yeah, downtown. Yes. Remember Hawaii. food town? No, no lake. No lake. There's a pool. So it's pool Hiawatha. Pool Hiawatha. So, 
<laughs> so um, my dad told us once that we climbed up a tree and got on top of the food town. And of course, somebody called the police. And so the police came and my dad told me, the police are never going to shoot at a nine-year-old while they're running away. So just keep running. And wow. all your friends are going to stop when the police say, stop. And you're going to run home and you're never going to have a problem. Because you're a white So that's what girl. I learned as a nine-year-old. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, blonde white girl. Yeah. By the way, I just remember you walking down the hall, this beautiful blonde hair yeah. flowing. So a lot gorgeous. of hair. But you know, I couldn't hang out at downtown like Hiawatha unless I was going somewhere and had come back. I kill you dead. I see you down there hanging out with the derelicts, shaming the family. <laughs> it's like I couldn't. We could go to Rose's store, get a submarine. Sandwich. Oh, the best. Oh, the best. The best. The I miss her. Best. Oh, Rose, I know. So, okay, first time you, you start, uh, Marilyn becomes a pilot at the age of 37. Right. Uh, so you're in a plane with somebody teaching you for how long? Um, I think it was, I changed instructors a few times because people would, uh, they would earn uh, hours of flying mm -hmm. time and then go to an airline and you'd be sitting here going, did I have an instructor still? And they quit and they go to an airline because that apparently pays better. So um, I went through a couple of instructors and I finally, uh, when it was finally time, let's see, I probably had about 60, 80 hours, something like that. Mm -hmm. But it is what it is. And uh, the minimum is 40. So you need to have at least 40 to be able to um, get your license. And um, when I f the first, I was just dying to solo. Just let's go. Let's just let's go. Yeah. And uh, I finally got the time to to go. And it was um, it wasn't as momentous as I expected. You know, it was like it, it, the airplane takes off so much easier because it's like half the weight, you know. Um, but it was yeah, it was it was not as oh, my God, as I was hoping it would be. There were bigger. Oh, my God. Down the road. What was the scariest thing that ever happened to you? You can tell us. Oh, I had my. I had my license for five, six months, maybe. And my engine died and I had to land it with, uh, it was like making that, you know, the commercial where they're like, clunk, 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 the engine's making a weird noise yes. and they start making the, well, it was making a clunk, a clunk, a noise because one of the, the valves had, um, didn't work anymore. So uh, it ended up, I was in, I was about 4,000, 4,500 feet. And coming in to, luckily, I was right over the old Castle Air Force Base in uh, Atwater, California. So, and I was uh, in formation with someone else. And he's like, no, there's no fire, no smoke. Just land it like you always do. And I'm like, did he say fire, smoke? I wasn't like, I wasn't ready for that. So I landed it fine and was able to just coast off the runway. And then it just died completely. And people were everywhere, you know, because they hear it on the radio no fire, no smoke, just land it, you're fine. And everybody's like, do you say smoke? <laughs> yeah, and everybody runs for the runway, so. You know who you are, Marilyn Dash? You are the Crazy. sully, you are the sully <laughs> of, of your world. That's who you are, you're the if sully. If it had happened after like six years of flying instead of six months, I probably would have been a little bit more prepared for it, but. Okay, I had a similar experience, but not at all. Um, <laughs> look at me trying to put a parallel that doesn't exist. I went parasailing in Mexico, Mexico. So there, are no, there are no, there are no personal injury lawyers. In There's Mexico. no FAA. There's no none of that. Yes. It was a year ago before the pandemic in de last December, and I, somebody double dog dared me. You know, you get double dog dared, and I'm. You got to do it. So you stay calm, you breathe, own whatever Shante means, and then I'm like. He's like, sit. So I sit in a little harness thing. That's what I'm told to do. And as I'm taking off in midair, he's like, sit, sit. I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting. What am I doing wrong? Obviously, I'm doing something wrong. And then I'm up in the sky. I'm like, okay, all right, okay, this is nice. If I could get into this and breathe, and I, I would be all right. Except they're speaking to. I don't know what I did wrong on takeoff, so I'm scared. And then he's like, oh look, come on, I go, no, 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 no. I'm in, it's, uh, hablo no español other than base of vino you got to get to me in English, dude. I was scared to death. Did I tell you that Harold Rosenthal said hello? Super interesting. We love that. Yeah. Very nice. Guy. We love you, Harold. Even though I called you Murray the cop in high school all the time. Such an easy going, nice man. And we got Kim Knackle. Hi, you, Kim. Hi, Hillary Steele. Hi, Matthew Polk. Good I don't people. see those. Well, Maureen Langan has many screens going at one time. There's three different Maureen. <laughs> I like speaking about myself in the third person. Um, okay, Matthew.
Marilyn Dash, let's get into what is your advice to um, to women? Why yeah, I, I always think that the best way to to move forward is to, you know, look to other people, find a mentor, find someone to ask advice for, join a group on Facebook. You know, all of those things are available to you. Another good thing is to go to the airport. Go to the airport and, and sit at the local, usually they have a bench or they have like a restaurant or they have a terminal. Go to the, lo not don't go to Newark airport, but go to the little one down the street, the San Carlos airport where I learned to fly and just uh, hang out there and ask questions. Um, people would love to help you. People will take you by the hand and lead you if you are respectful and interested and don't, you know, don't check your phone in the middle of a, t a moment when some World War II veteran is telling you a great story about getting shot down over France. You know, put down your phone and listen to them respectfully and they'll tell you anything. They'll do anything for you. So that, those are kind of my hints for, for young people who are interested in getting into this. I put like yourself out there. Too. Be, well, there's in New Jersey, there's Teterboro Airport, poor John F. Kennedy Jr. I mean, he shouldn't have, well, whatever. He may, that's where he flew out of, I think. Mm -hmm. There's Fairfield. There's one in Fairfield. I was just going to say there's one in Fairfield. There's one in Somerset somewhere, Franklin. Um, there's one in Andover. There's They're all over the place. Isn't there a small one too by Morristown? You guys, this, for those of you not- Morristown, talking, a memorial. Like there's a great airport in Morristown. Well, I say this because I think what you're saying is really smart. Like- I can't stand it. Like you you go somewhere and it's this, you know, you're talking to someone and it's respectful to hear them. That's, that's like the best advice because when somebody feels respected and heard, they'll help you. Okay. I, the person who was one of my first mentors and one of my instructors, he, he used to always tell me, he goes, I will teach you anything as long as you're, you're, you're there, you're present and you're paying attention and you're giving me feedback. The minute you pick up your phone, I'm gone. Fair enough. Yep. Uh, Bedminster too. Yep. There's one in Bedminster. This is all Jersey stuff. They're all over the place. Yeah. They're everywhere. They have airports everywhere. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> to say, hey, are you doing some public speaking these days? What are you a doing? A lot. Yeah. Are a lot. You? I um in fact I'm speaking tomorrow night at the Hiller Aviation Museum, my my alma mater as I look at it. And I'm doing uh the the where uh, Reno Air Races and the future of air racing. Is going to be my topic tomorrow. Um, I've done a lot about the women of air of aviation, the women of air racing. I've done um, a lot on the Reno air races. I spoke at a keynote right before we did, went into lockdown last year, and about I think it was twenty one hundred people, and they're all in the aviation business. So I love doing that. I love talking about STEM. I love talking about aviation, about women getting into these other um, fields and uh, getting kids to see things differently and. You know, I just finished um, the Elon Musk book. And one of the things that has struck me so much about that book is um, back in the early day, back in 1937, let's just say, sure. people were always interested in how to make things better. Racing is always, you know, how to build something better, how to make it faster, how to make it safer. And now we're all worried about getting clicks. You know, how many clicks did I get on Instagram? How many likes did I get? And we're not building anything. And I would like to see us getting back to that, getting back to building and having a generation of people who are interested in aviation, racing, science, mechanical engineering. You know, how does this work? Did you see the thing the other day on, on um, robots on the Boston company? That was just, I was like mesmerized by these robots. We, sh we need more of that. We need more robots. Click. We need more robots. But I'll tell you, Marilyn Dash, no, I'm kidding you. But you know, um, it's funny because everything is about social media and I, I sometimes I got to just get out of off of it and go for a hike or just download go walk the dog. Yes. Something. Oh, my dogs are dead, but I go to the neighbors and say, can I walk your dogs? I'm not even joking. I'm like, can I take your dog? I'll take your dog hiking with me. I'll take, I have a dog here. The, the woman's I have mine. She's right behind me. Yeah, this you is take a, her. I have a stranger's dog. No, I have the neighbor's dog, but you know what it is too? Somebody's like, Maureen, you got to be on this platform. You have to be on this other platform. I, I like growing this show. This is mm -hmm. good. Or when you're performing or you're doing a talk, you want people to know and support. But somebody goes, oh, you got to be on this other platform. I go, I am so tired of liking people I hate. <laughs> don't make me hate you. Don't make me hate you. Get your don't make me hate you t-shirt, you guys. I need one mind. now. I didn't know they existed. I want the mask. I want the shirt. I'll I want send the you crown. One. I'll send you a t-shirt. I'll send awesome. you one. I want to. Um, but, you know, we're going to, I just want to give a shout out and um, stay with us because Beth Dolan is going to join us and she is a filmmaker, a documentarian, and her film is Stranger at Home about 
the military, these, she highlights um, the military and these, their personal stories and it's riveting. Um, so she'll be with me in just a minute, but you know what? I'm so glad that you hung out with me today and I want people to know, Harold says, more science engineers, fewer lawyers. Um, <laughs> poor lawyers. So if you want to support the show, PayPal and Venmo, Mo Langen. And if you want to follow Marilyn Dash, let me put her information up here. She's great. You know, you are such a supportive person. You've come to my show. You're just very open hearted. Yes, we had a blast. I think I went to see it three times. Did you? I knew you were there. Oh, that was very kind. Daughter of a garbage man. So much fun. Ah, uh, uh, Marilyn dot dash on Instagram, Twitter dash or four Facebook dash for life coaching. And you know what, what a great speaker she would be for an organization, a group, men or women mixed. Um, you know, we're bipartisan in this world. Okay. Yes, we um, are. Everybody's welcome. Thank you, darling. Thank you. This I'll wait really for my kind. shirt. I'm going to send you a shirt. You're going to email me. I'm going to send you after. one too. Oh, what kind are you sending me? I have the Ruby red racing shirts. No. Okay, before I go, I gotta just show you the picture of Marilyn one more time in her. Um, well, here's is here's her plane. Is that your plane? That great? Yeah, that's her. That's Ruby. Ruby. Yes. You guys, you got to see this. I, I've posted it all over my Facebook page. This is such a great plane, and here she is. Um, that picture was taken from the ground. That's how close I was to the ground. Oh wow! Yeah, that's when you're racing. You're less than fifty feet off the ground. Well, if you fall out, at least. You know, <laughs> I have a parachute on. Don't worry. Look at you. I love that. Um, safe flying to you. How come I Thank can't you, get these pictures off? And um, yeah, safe flying. Continued good health and much we'll success. We'll be in touch. Mwah. Mwah. Okay, you guys. Always good to see you. You too, Marilyn. All right, now. That was good, right? Good informative stuff. Okay. Oh, I have another bell in case you're, you're sick of that one. So I want to introduce my next guest. This is the double header you got. You are so lucky that I worked this hard for you. Coming to Maureen Langan's Zoom stage. Uh, Dash is a shortened version of Marilyn's last name, and I'm not, it's legal. She's, it's her legal name, and it's her name. Just one letter was cut off, maybe five, maybe 12. But listen, it, it's a great name, and it's her name. Um, so be safe, says Harold. People are nice. Um, Okay, now let me introduce my next guest. I want to give her a proper introduction. She is a writer, producer, director of Stranger at Home, the untold story of American military mental health. Uh, contrasts three stories, three veterans, three generations, three wars, and it is profound. The mental health reform is so crucial right now in the military. Tomorrow, there's going to be a live stream event on Facebook at 4 p.m. Pacific time, Stranger at Home documentary. Follow that on Facebook, Stranger at Home documentary. But now let's please welcome to the Zoom stage, Beth Dolan. <laughs> Hi, Beth. Good. Hi, Maureen. That was awesome. I wanted to listen to Marilyn longer. Isn't she one? I know. She's oh, my, one of you, right? oh, my goodness. She's, uh, She's great. Yes. Yes. Warm, smart. I don't hang out with crap, Beth. That's why you're here. <laughs> I, I'm getting that, and uh, I'm honored. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm honored to have you. So let me ask you this: This film, "Stranger at Home: The Untold Story of American Military Mental Health." Yeah. Um, I have a clip. Can we start with the clip? Absolutely. And take it from there. Okay. This is um, a clip of the film and what I want to set up is the man, you'll see a young man in this with a beard and his name is Stephen Elliott. And sadly he has to carry a burden that in friendly fire uh, caused, his friendly fire caused the death of Pat Tillman. And that has, I mean, can you imagine? So here we go, here's a, a bit of a clip for you folks, stranger at home. We use psychology to develop ways to efficiently train people how to kill. We haven't applied that same research and emphasis on how to help people best deprogram that. 2006, there was definitive evidence to show that you should never send someone who has PTSD back into combat. And yet we did it. <laughs> We're knowingly re-exposing people to levels of traumatic stress that we know is unhealthy. PTSD was riddling my system and 
I couldn't allow myself to receive um, help that was waiting there for me. I had to get to a place where I was helpless and I was willing to rest in um, the care of others. The military puts us in an ethical dilemma because our clients are not only the active duty with PTSD or depression or grief, but our clients are the military as an officer and a military psychologist. So our expectation from the military as a mental health provider is that we're going to find people, we're going to treat them if they need to be treated, but generally we're going to send everybody back to the front lines. So there are a lot of people I sent back whose wives or husbands pleaded that this person is not in their right mind. They shouldn't go back. But that individual was telling me they're fine. And I knew that in my heart they weren't fine. That their wife or husband told me they're not fine. But I couldn't convince the commander not to take them. Absolutely painfully riveting. Beth Dill, the producer, co-director of Stranger at Home about the mental health. The first, the untold story of American military mental health. Wow. Yeah, it's not a rom-com. <laughs> no, no, no. 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 Um, it's important. It's and powerful. It is. it is. And, and you know, what's interesting or, or what, what I continue to share is I, I've met so many other wonderful doc filmmakers and I know you, You've, you've had your hand in that in those worlds as well. Mm -hmm. I've met many other doc filmmakers who are doing stories about the military story, mental health, and all the prisms of perspective, and they're all wonderful. There can't be enough stories, but ours ours gets under all of that, and we're here to spotlight, you know, why there is uh, 20, 20 suicides a day. Uh, so there's just the journey of, of, of making this film and of finding these particular veterans who had these really underneath it story to share was what made me and my team say, whoa, we got to go big or go home. I want people to hear that. What you yeah. said is there are 20 military people who serve our country, who keep us safe, who fight for us, who are so freaking brave 20 of them, 20, if you line up a day, committing suicide. Yeah. That's, um, and that's active duty, that's veteran, um, and that statistic is still from 2014 RAND reports. So we're looking at that, and with the and with COVID, the year of COVID, and, and more isolation, and all of, the, all of those um, stressors that put everyone into those darker places, um, depression, PTSD, all COVID has just really pushed those numbers probably even further. So what I want people to know about this film, when is the, uh, uh, when is the release date of Stranger at Home? Thanks for asking. We're looking, you know, we, we've hunkered down during the pandemic to really just move on post-production and we're looking at the fall of 2021 as the beginning of our distribution journey. So we're we're effectively in pre-distribution phase right now, and you know it's just getting the word out, getting you know getting more of an audience, building an audience with us. And there's, you know, quite frankly, there's a real listening now for these topics of trauma and PTSD. God knows we've all been through it in the last year. Mm -hmm. It's not just a, 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 a it's a military focused story, but there's a listening now for that story because there's a there's an empathy, you know. We're, we're, Thank, thanks to a pandemic, there is a yeah. conversation, you know? Well, yeah, and uh, to that end, I, these are personal stories. These are personal stories, and I want to get into some of the people in this film, but I want people to know that tomorrow you're going to have a live conversation, and people who are in this film are going to be included. And you guys, it's right here on Facebook, just like what we're doing all you have to do is support this because you're supporting, honestly, you're supporting America. You're supporting the people who lay down their lives for you. And it makes me so emotional. 
it, it's so emotional. I have a brother who served in uh, Desert Storm and he struggles. So you go, it's Champion Mental Health. It's tomorrow, Wednesday, the 31st. That's at four o'clock Pacific time. And you just go to Stranger at Home documentary. There's a Facebook page, Stranger at Home documentary. It's that easy. And if you go, oh, but I want to be reminded, I'm such a, you know, my head gets all dopey. All right, go to strangeratthome.org and then you'll get a little ping. Hey, it's time. Okay. That's all. How easy is that? And then you're supporting, you're supporting people who deserve to be supported. Um, I have another short clip here. Superstar Beth Dolan, who helps people. You help people. I gotta help people. I gotta do more. You just uh, did. You just did. Can you be I, on my can you be on my promotions team, please? I, will, I, I am. I know you are. You are. This is incredible. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. My little chat show. Uh so um, I want to show another clip of these are some of the people who are presented in stranger at home so you know it's not like you're, you're going to like a class with statistics there are statistics but not like a chalkboard lecture it's from the heart here we go Get the two or three up. these bodies they're stacked up like Being a Marine is something I'm really proud of, but I see the psychological impact that um, I come to the table a little bit broken. I was 19 and I had to mentally prepare myself to die. Okay, anybody else want to cry? <laughs> <laughs> but it's real and people have to face this and one of the stories in it, that young woman the young guy that it's different aged people mm -hmm. but one of the things um one of the fellows it's because the burden of Stephen elliott mm -hmm. um set up who Stephen elliott is for those just tuning in right now yeah um well that clip that we just watched that, that those i mean we interviewed so many incredible veterans fit, family members, everything at, in our research and development. And that, so that, that was a really early clip before we really arrived at our, at our story, which is three veterans, as you've been saying at the top of the, sh at the top of your show, three veterans from three different war generations. They're our main storytellers. One is a whistleblower, one is Stephen Elliott, and the other is a colleague of both of them. And they're two doctors of psychology. So, so that's our intimate, that's the story that's the release that's coming out, the film itself. Um, I love seeing the older clips because so many veterans informed our storytelling as we went along. Mm -hmm. Stephen Elliott though, to your point. So um, I'll never forget the day he walked in and sat down and did an interview with us in rainy, cold Seattle. He's, he, he was from the Northwest, yeah, Northwest at the time. Yeah. And he walked in and he, he had been sent to us by our main storyteller, the main voice of the film, Dr. Mark Russell. He said, you have to meet Stephen. He, and the way he said it was, he was directly involved in the friendly fire incident that killed Pat Tillman. So, you know, I'm from a big Irish American family, Irish Catholic family, and football is a huge thing. I've got five brothers and it's just, you know, Notre Dame and the whole nonsense. I, I grew up watching football. I can play football, but I don't, I don't care about it. But that pinged my mind and I had to look up truly what had happened and realize that, whoa, this was a big story. And can you fill up people in a bit? Who I will. I will. Pat Tillman, I, I believe he played for the, the Cardinals. Um, he was, he had just signed a huge multi-million dollar contract. This was in 2003, I believe it was. He's a young man, he's 21, 22, maybe a little bit older. Steven, our guy, was about 21. And it was, it, it was earlier than actually, it was post 9-11, almost immediately post 9-11. So many young men and women at that time, because of that trauma, said, I want to sign up and defend my country. So Pat Tillman left his big NFL contract. Stephen Elliott in his hometown in Kansas, in business school at the time, smart young man going forward, thinking about being a lawyer. He, he says, I'm going to sign up too. 
and they both they both moved into the Army Ranger Regiment, which is kind of like Navy SEALs. It's kind of like the elite uh, mm -hmm. core of uh, the, the Army. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be on the front line, Stephen, as did Pat Tillman, and they met in the Ranger Regiment and were deployed together to Afghanistan in 2004. It was their very first deployment. And they were in country for about six weeks doing all kinds of just exercises, no real mission. These are highly trained, you know, army guys now. And they get their first, you know, sort of recon where they had to go out. And it was a complete kerfuffle. Uh, their breakdown in communications, trucks broke down. Their commanding base was saying, you gotta drag this truck back. They split up their element. That's what happened. That was the order that came down. And apparently I've learned that's the dumbest and worst thing you can do when you're out in really sort of very dangerous territory is to split up your element because communications can go south. And they did. And so Stephen was in one element. He was a gunner on one of the trucks mm -hmm. and Pat Tillman was with the other element. They had been sent off to do something else. It was nightfall in these big canyons in Afghanistan and the light is not, you know, people can't see very well. Stephen's element, they, they, they actually, they, they came into an IED. So an IED is, a, is an underground explosive that's planted and their truck rolled over it. And so there was this, you know, <clears throat> casualty feeling that was going on and the commanding officer of Steve's element said there's there's enemies and up on a ridge were Pat and his element and Steven's element thought that they were enemy they couldn't see and they were ordered to start firing in that direction he was and, ordered yes. Stephen Elliott was ordered to shoot in the direction of Pat Tillman that's right that's right that so, poor fellow. Yep. So, that, oh, go ahead. So, no, no, no. I mean, that's, I mean, so to, to wrap the story up, yeah, he, they, they ordered, it was over very quickly. They got, they got Steve's element out of there. This is all Steven's point of view. And it wasn't until nightfall and the whole platoon is now going back to the forward operating base in the dark, like a five hour drive that Steven saw one, the other gunner that, that fired in the direction there were two that fired so they'll never know which is also yeah. ways on the mind he saw this guy with his head on his chest and said and and he said what's going on and he said because word was starting to trickle back that there were two kia and two wounded in the afternoon's affair and that pat tillman was one of them and he's and the, this other gunner said to, to steve and he said I fired in that direction. It, I could have been the one. And then it hit Stephen that I too fired in that direction and I could have been the one. So both of them traveling back to the forward operating base. And so from there, everything fell apart. Uh, what, what the American public does not know is that uh, the Tillman family was actually lied to. Um, his mother, Pat Tillman's mother was told that her son died um, saving his other fellow rangers by charging them, you know, a, a ridge. It was a friendly fire. It, that's, that's all that it was. It was an accident. Mm -hmm. So they painted this more heroic picture. The family at a football stadium in front of, you know, thousands of people on national television was awarded the Purple Heart for this heroic gesture. So it was a big story that got swept under the carpet and got a spin point on it. Stephen, who actually killed him, his friend and his colleague, uh, had no idea this was going on. He was still in country. Meanwhile, he was getting written up for poor weapons use. He was ordered to shoot. He was highly trained. He was ordered to shoot, but he, they, they wrote him up as poor weapons and he was immediately moved out of the regiment and given a driving job back in the States, driving like a Brigadier General around. Meanwhile, his life was falling apart. He had no idea the impact of this. And what he said to me, and I'll wrap it up, is that 
there are thousands and thousands and thousands of friendly fire stories. Yeah. But because this one drew such public attention because of who it was, you know, still, you know, family lost their son, a family lost their brother, he lost a friend. Because of who it was, that's why it got so much attention. Of course, of course. Of course. And, um, you know, so anyway, that's, he's, he's, he's personifies PTSD right. and that right. impact. So that's his story. Um, and he openly shared his heart with us. So he's, Mm, I um, what I want to, uh, if you're just tuning in, filmmaker Beth Dolan, her movie Stranger at Home, um, the untold story of American military mental health. We're going to go on to some other people who are featured in this uh, documentary. Yeah, we were just mentioning Stephen Elliott, who had the unfortunate um, oh, burden that friendly fire he may have or another man with him may have been the reason that Pat Tillman died. There are many instances, as you say, uh, of friendly fire. Uh, before we move on, though, um, I want to let people, before we move on to other topics, I want people to know that you're doing a really great thing tomorrow on Facebook Live. This is what's so great about Facebook Live, you guys. You can really connect with people like Beth here, and then you can go watch tomorrow at 4 o'clock Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time, Champion Mental Health on the Facebook page, Stranger at Home documentary. Just go to go like it now. I won't even be mad at you if you just go over there and come right back. Just go to, I, I would do that for you because I'm all about love. Go to a Stranger at Home documentary and just sign up tomorrow. And if you go, oh, but Maureen, I'll do that immediately. But what if I forget? Oh, that's okay. Go to strangerathome.org and just sign up. You don't have to if something comes up, you know, but nothing's going to come up. This is really, this is important because these are people who, serve us. And what we can do is honor them by watching. There's going to be people on the panel. Will Stephen be there or he's not on the panel? No, St Stephen will be there and his wife is joining him. This is this is her story too. Wow. What, what people don't know, you know, thank you so much for that. Just go over to strangerhome.org. I really appreciate I it. Well, how can we support it too financially? Can we do well, something? It's right there on our film site. You know, every dollar that has been raised has been done through contribution uh, to this film in the time that we've been making it. So, you know, we have the, we have our portal right there to contribute. And if you want to, if a tax break is important to you, this is a fiscally sponsored film, which means it's a 501c3 project and you get to claim a tax credit if you, you know, want to contribute and it means something to, you know, that contribution, you want that write off. So most people contribute because they want to contribute. So. And listen, uh, you know what, if you pay what you can um, in my accounts, I will pass that along to uh, Beth. It's at paypal.me Molangan, Venmo at Molangan. So this way, you know, you just, whatever, $5, $10, you know, I, I will pass it on, on to her. Yeah. Uh, share the information. Uh, our good friend is saying, Right, share this, go like the page, tell everybody, share this while you're watching now. This is, we're gonna support people who have fought for us. Um, and just on a lighter note, our good friend, Molly, uh, Molly Barber, Molly McCloskey Barber, she was the romper room lady in <laughs> the New Jersey, New York tri-state area. And you uh, and she went to uh, college together, I understand. We did, we did, hi, Miss Molly. Hi. We love you, Miss Molly. We love you, you know. God, look at us. There's there's three Irish chicks here. I know, right? In Raleigh, right? Um, yeah, she just had a birthday too. So, oh, happy know. birthday, Molly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you know, support you guys. Oh, and my don't make me hate you t-shirt, by the way. You can get that at MaureenLangan.com. We got masks, we have it all. And if you want to uh subscribe to the show, I do it every week at Tuesdays. I might start doing it in the evening. You'll let me know what you think. But um you can go to Patreon and that's a really good way to support the show and keep guests like Beth coming on or Marilyn Dash, the pilot who was here earlier, patreon.com. And you could subscribe beginning at five bucks and there's different levels. So you can get a t-shirt at a certain level. You can um, do a wine party. We can do some public speaking or coaching. There's different things at different levels. So uh, just keep that in mind. Thank you. So, all right. Um, a big shout out to Sheila Higgins and Jenny McNulty, who brought you to my attention. They're watching. Um, thank you, you gals, for sharing her with me. So before we move on from Stephen Elliott, because I think he has to embody 
the mental health needs at one of the highest levels mm -hmm. to carry that burden. How does a man like him reconcile his soul to what he's been asked to do for his country by no fault of his own? How does it, how do you reconcile that? That's a great question. And I'll be sure I ask him that. Please do. You want me to write out some questions for you for tomorrow? Please do. Please do. <laughs> I'm, ta I'm taking a page from your hosting skills. I'm moderating this panel. You know, I, I know these guys, I know these guys and I know the subject matter, but man, just that's a great question. And he's, he's come a long way. I mean, it's uh, over 16 years. He lost his marriage. He alcoholism, the whole path. Really? The woman that he's still with, he, he remarried his wife. She's joining us on the show. So their, their journey together is pretty extraordinary. I don't think recovery from any trauma and I'm speaking to everybody right now after a year of a pandemic, happens overnight. It's a process and it has to be done with a lot of love and compassion and zero stigma, which is what this show is about, our championing mental health. We're, we're there to champion each other, our mental health. And, um, and it couldn't be a better first show than to do it with this cast that I, that I love, that they move me every time. I watch the clips I've known them for so long, but I watch the clips and something in my heart just opens just a little bit more. So um, he has quite a story as does, as do our other two guests, our main cast. And they, they're, they're there to also talk about topics that are massive for all of us right now, trauma. And it's an hour show. So, you know, it's an hour, you'll learn a lot in an hour. Um, has he been able to reconcile him? Has he found some peace? Yes. Yeah, of course. And like I said, it's not an overnight process. He's He's got a deep spiritual life. I think that would be his first answer. That's what he shared with us mm -hmm. in, the, in that early interview. You know, how a, a deep spiritual life. And as you saw in the clip, he had to be willing to get help. He had to be willing to pry his hands off of his own life, the steering wheel of his own life, and say, as a, a male, uh, a military male, I need help. Can Which, I show the clip again for those just uh, jumping in? Perhaps sure, sure, Do you sure. have time to hang out with me another 10 minutes? Heck Sorry. yeah. Heck yeah. Oh, Thank you so much. much. Yeah. All right. Here's um. This is a clip from Stranger at Home, the untold story of American military mental health. It'll be released hopefully the fall of 2021. And you can support it by going to Stranger at Home documentary right on Facebook. It's just you know, throw 20 bucks, five bucks, the price of a bottle of wine, whatever you can. If you can do more, do more. It's tax deductible. It has all those numbers behind it, 503821 thing. So you can, you can, I was an English major, not math, whatever. But um, whatever, I don't really talk. No, I know what you mean, it's tax deductible. Yeah, yeah. And tomorrow, go like her page right now, Stranger at Home documentary, right now on Facebook. Just like it. Don't make me hate you. Um, so the gentleman in here, the um, that is Steve Elliott, and he will be on this panel tomorrow. With his wife. With his wife. With his wife that he remarried once he got spiritual and once he stopped the drinking and once he got the mental help that he needs that we all need. We all need mental help, but these soldiers and these men and women serving us big time, um, they need support. So here we go. We use psychology to develop ways to efficiently train people how to kill. We haven't applied that same research and emphasis on how to help people best deprogram that. 2006, there was definitive evidence to show that you should never send someone who has PTSD back into combat. And yet we did it. <laughs> We're knowingly re-exposing people to levels of traumatic stress that we know is unhealthy. PTSD was riddling my system and I couldn't allow myself to receive um, help that was waiting there for me. I had to get to a place where I was helpless and I was willing to rest in um, the care of others. The military puts us in an ethical dilemma because our clients are not only the active duty with PTSD or depression or grief, but our clients are the military as an officer and a military psychologist. So our expectation from the military as a mental health provider is that we're going to find people, we're going to treat them if they need to be treated, but generally we're going to send everybody back to the 
front lines. So there are a lot of people I sent back whose wives or husbands pleaded that this person is not in their right mind. They shouldn't go back. But that individual was telling me they're fine. And I knew in my heart they weren't fine. That their wife or husband told me they're not fine. But I couldn't convince the commander not to take them. Very powerful, Beth Dolan, the director, producer, writer of Stranger at Home. Um, the gentleman speaking in that worked in the military. Mm -hmm. um, he, I was wondering, and I was reading a lot about you in the film, but mm -hmm. why, we always hear <clears throat> that the military, we're taking care of our vets. We hear every administration say, we're taking everyone. <clears throat> we've got to take care of our vets. The vets are, they should all have like, gold in their pockets and the best homes, they should be revered at the highest levels, not be homeless in gutters or, or just so um, needing of that kind of mental health and been left alone. What the hell is not changing and why? Why are they not getting, why? This seems impossible. And why are they being thrown back into a situation that really caused them what we used to call shell shock, but now we call PTSD? Yeah, uh, there's the quest. There's the conversation we're going to have with all of them tomorrow night about the essential need that military mental health policy has to change. And that, to you know, to your other point about Stephen and, and how's he reconciling this, he's giving back. He's part of that cohort of veterans, the three men you just met, mm -hmm. who are looking, focused on changing military mental health policy. That policy has been in place for over 100 years. Wow. Yeah. And it, it yeah. that's it's such a long conversation and I know you don't have time for it, but I'll- Yes, I'll so you can talk about whatever you like. I have, do not have a re-entry program, a mental health re-entry program for our soldiers returning. The last time we did, this is startling, get ready. The last time we did, was in 1946 when FDR served three terms as an office and he saw the returning troops men at the time, of course, coming back from World War II, dead in their eyes, gone, shell shock, you just said it, really serious psychiatric wounds. He said to the Department of Defense as our commander in chief, he said, we must do better, we will do better. We're going to create a program, a re-entry program for these soldiers right off the transport ships, not back to their homes, <laughs> right off the transport ships. We're gonna create a program. It's gonna have alternative, ther alternative therapies, art therapy, music therapy. It was cutting edge, uh, sports therapy. Wow. Uh, you know, talk therapy, uh, job, uh, vocational training to be able to return to another job, family integration therapy. This was part of a reentry program that FDR mandated, mandated the Department of Defense to do. And they did. And they, <laughs> here's the startling part. John Houston, director, yeah. was in the army at the time a young um, officer. And he, as a filmmaker, was co-opted by the army to document this program. And he did. And there were no actors in it. It was truly soldiers coming off the transport ships. He documented it. There's a record of it. So you see these people dead, these soldiers behind their eyes with all kinds of symptomology and conditions. And then you see them at the end of, I believe it was a three week or a six week program before they go out into the public world. And the transformation was startling, like successful, startling. Is this accessible, the work that John did? Yes, yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one more little startling thing and I'm gonna tell people where they can watch okay. the film. This film, had its New York premiere and it was confiscated by the military police at that time. This is 1946. They, came, they, they paid for the film. They, they followed FDR's instructions. They put the program in place. And then they said, "Uh oh, we don't want people to know that this program worked. They confiscated the film from public viewing. They shelved it, they classified it. And it wasn't until Jimmy Carter's administration, like 35 years later, 
that the film was found, dusted off, and declassified. You can watch it. Here comes the title. You can watch it on YouTube. It's called Let There Be Light. Okay. It's melodramatic. It's black and white. It's 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 startling, but it's it's a program. It's a blueprint of a program that worked. So FDR died in office. The war ended. The program, of course, evaporated. And there has yeah, been well, how come, of course? Like, first of all, I don't understand why the military wouldn't be like, look what we're doing. It's working out. Isn't this great? We're helping. Like, wouldn't that be a plus? Yeah, you, you think, you think that's that's the underlying story here that we're told one thing out here that we're, you know, that the military is doing their, you know, everything they can for their troops. And yet we still have a 20, 20 suicide per day statistic, which is heinous. There should be, you know, one is too many. So, so there's a reentry program, is there? Oh, you know, no. like you get, get off the ship or the plane and it's like, look to you, person no. with PTSD. There has not been one since that time. And that is one of the massive, like, just like no brainer solutions that this story and our, our intimate storytellers are saying, this has to be put in place, a reentry program for our, our, you know, the people that serve to deprogram them from this killing machine that they were trained into. There's no reverse of that that happens for them. And so this this is where you know they just they leave and they they end up in Walmart right off the. There's more time. There was more time on the transport ships for decompression. But today you can be in country on a plane and in Walmart with your family the next day, and you have no idea where you are. And that thus the title: you are a stranger at home. So the fact that there is no program, mental health program. That it's it's a huge story that this that we're talking about in this film to take a, a real look at what isn't there to really say this is what needs to be there so we can handle the homelessness the, the incarceration the suicide that understanding so yeah there's a there's a there's a there's an interesting spin we're asking the military these guys not me these guys are asking the military that they loved that they trained with that they still love and respect our main storyteller's 26 year career military he was a whistleblower military psychologist let me set this up in the film there yeah. is a um military fellow what is his name his name is dr mark russell and <clears throat> Dr. Mark Russell is in the film. He's so accessible. He was in the military for years, tried to bring attention to the issues of mental health, was a whistleblower. So tell us what happened to him. He's in, will he be at the... Um, yep. He's going to be on the panel tomorrow night with Steve Elliott and with their other cohort, Dr. Charles Figley, who's also a world-renowned trauma psychologist. He's a Vietnam Marine vet. So, so let's put that out there tomorrow, mental health, champion mental health live on Facebook, just go to stranger at home documentary, like it now. I'll let you take a bit. I'll let you have a second break to go do that because I'm all big hearted. And it's tomorrow, Wednesday, the 31st of March, 4 PM Pacific, 7 PM Eastern stranger at home documentary right here on Facebook. Just go like it. And uh, it's only an hour. It is really their red carpet event. And they are going to have this whistleblower who is working like a, a dog to fix these issues. Stephen Elliott, who sadly was part of that friendly fire that killed Pat Tillman. And one more. Um, His name is Dr. Charles Figley and he's he works in cohort with the other two. So there are they're just three veterans that are, that are deeply focused on changing that the policy that is the status quo that keeps uh, this mental health crisis cycling around, you know? Okay. So there's it, it uh, they're all about the solutions. They're not about they're not about disrespecting their military, but they're asking the military to be held accountable. I think I think Harry can help. I think you got to get Harry. I think so. Harry can help. I believe oh, yeah. Harry. Oh yeah. Oh, if you know Harry, like I know Harry. What because Can you get Harry? Can you get Harry? Cuz I can. He's going to be on my show next Tuesday. You know what? You're going to host the next Championing Mental Health episode. You get Harry. Get him uh, on. I will. I will. I get Harry. I might be Harry Schlossensinger from a street, but it will be Harry. But I'll he's meet him at Katz's Deli in New York, and I'll bring him. Yeah, he's been he's been such a voice for mental health and the military piece in England. Now, they changed their policies in England. 
the, that's a whole other story that we'll get we'll get to tomorrow night. They the MOD, not our our we have a DOD. They have an MOD. They had so many you know PTSD lawsuits brought against them that they finally agreed to change their policy. Their numbers in PTSD have come down. Their suicide rates have come down. So their policy changes include zero stigma. Stigma is the big issue in the military. They weaponize it. You, If you get sent to someone like Dr. Mark Russell when he was serving as a military psychologist, if your commanding officer is sending you to him, he has to, by orders, write you up as a personality disorder. And if they want to get rid of you because of that, because you're acting up, you're drinking, you're beating up your wife, you can't handle your fifth deployment anymore, he has to write that up. And then when you come out, you are not honorably discharged. You can't get job. That's right. That's right. So it's stigma. I mean, he, he, that's what he had to live with as a military psychologist. That's, that is part of the policy still in the military, that you are weak. I'm going to use some words that he used. You're considered a limp dick. You're, you're, you know, you're weak for having mental health issues. And that, you cannot be honorably discharged. You are not honorably discharged. You, and then you cannot get jobs in security, in police work, those areas where veterans really could serve again and have a purpose again. Do you get discharged, but is it considered uh, a dishonorable discharge or are you just discharged without honors? Correct, discharged without honors. It's a mark against your record that you had um, personality disorder, psychiatric disorder, which the stigma then carries over here in society. See, if the military changed their policies about stigma and had a zero stigma tolerance, which is what the MOD did in England, and their rates and their their performance with their troops came up, their rates for depression and suicide came down. They removed that stigma among other policy changes. You have a stronger fighting force. You have a mentally fit, balanced fighting force where they're talking about your brain is gonna change. We're gonna train you to kill or be killed. Your brain's gonna change, but we're here for you rather than we're gonna train you and we're really not here for you. We're and just going to throw you to the wind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's still... Two, two that's... things I'm hearing here is after FDR implemented this um, come home and heal kind of policy and integrate yeah. your family, yeah. that the military did not um, like when John um, Houston, Houston, is it Houston? Houston. I'm from New York, yeah. Houston. I know yeah. Houston, Houston Street. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. When he documented all this and the military took the film away and the film is called let there be light i will post the link sheila just share, shared it uh, but it's hard okay. to you know yeah. cut and paste that on uh, yeah. but i'll post it um yeah. the military probably rescinded it because they didn't want to know that people were coming out with problems to begin with that needed healing i bet everything, you know, they, they just was like, oh, 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 we're going to lose our fighting force. We're going to, people are going to be asking for pensions. Everything came up. Do you know how much money it costs to manage all of these mental health disorders coming into society as a result of not being treated versus taking care of them at the beginning, during, and after? It, it, it it's, it's, it's a crazy bit of business, but the military panicked and they just said, we don't want people to know that we know what's going on mental health wise. We know how to treat it. We just, we don't want people to know that. And that's what that film shows us. It's a blueprint of therapy and how it works and how to treat. So, so that was ahead of the time. And we've really gone backwards since 1946. Yeah. We haven't budged. We just haven't budged. And there's more wars and there's more and, and soldiers are staying alive because of surgical, you know, uh, advancements. I mean, we take a page from the physical wounds of war. Our, our surgeries and our hospitals pay attention to the military and how they do it, how they reattach a limb, you know, in the field, for God's sake. They, we take a page from that. We don't take it from the mental health side as well. But we have the resources, we have the knowledge. So it's it's up to them to be the chieftains in mental health, the military. 
Okay, so what are we, okay, so this panel tomorrow, and, and I'll give another plug before you head out, but Thanks. what is the answer, Beth? I mean, to, to these whistleblowers, does this uh, doctor, uh, he's a psychologist, right? Um, right, Dr. Doctor, Russell. Yeah, Dr. Russell. Russell. Yes. Does he have a pipeline to the yes. Department of Defense? Are they hearing him? Uh, he's got his own institute, the Institute for, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking here. The Institute for Recovery and Social Justice is his organization. And that's a melting pot for all the resources to just create this groundswell and to um, every for everyone to learn this stuff and be a voice. And I think it's because you know, of, of this pandemic time that these subjects are now, there's a, like I said, there's a listening for it, which is why we're doing the show and just bringing them out. You know, he, they need all the help that they can get to get our Congress's attention to, and this is not a political show that we're doing. It could be anything. It's what, whatever's real. Whatever's it's, really, real. It's, you know, it's like, it's like, I just want to say that, you know, Joe's the guy, Joe, you know, his son, Bo, I mean, there's a, there's a consciousness in the White House now that could look at this and say, oh, I, I, I'm going to just tell the DOD that they have to change their policies. And but I thought the prior administration supposedly did a lot to help veterans. I, I don't know. I'm, I, I have uh, in that particular show because I don't know anything about it. Pieces and fragments, but there wasn't a deep understanding or, or real knowledge of what, what's really needed here. I and, see. That, that, and I'm not, and I'm not casting. Well, I'm not being political. I'm actually, no, you know, no. please, if you know how I felt, but I'm just talking about realistically, I want to like, you know, the former journalist in me likes to know the facts. Yeah. So it sounds like there was a respect for the military and there was uh, help in certain areas, but not this area. People don't understand the depth of it, like Dr. Uh, Russell and Dr. Figley, and uh, yeah, that, that's Figleaf. I'm going to call him Figleaf. I like calling him. No, Figleaf. no, I do, I do that. Too. <laughs> it's just a funnier name. So, so, do you think that this message will get to Biden and the DOD, and there could potentially be change? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, do. I, I think we're tracking in that direction. Not, not that this film is the is the is the change agent. But it's again, it's it's a current record for what John Houston did of what's possible and what's needed, and right. yeah. So, so yeah, tomorrow this champion mental health. The film is Stranger um, at Home will be debuting, released in the fall of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, champion Mental Health tomorrow, Wednesday, the 31st of March at 4 p.m. Pacific, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern. Right here, just go to Stranger at Home documentary Facebook page. That's it. Oh, Maureen, where do I go? I, I really want to see. It's a one-hour uh, panel. Um, Dr. Mark Russell, the Institute of War, Stress, Injury, Recovery, and Social Justice will be on the panel. Uh, Stephen Elliott, who sadly was involved in that friendly fire shooting of Pat Tillman, talking about his marriage broke up. He got involved in alcohol and God knows what, so suffered so, and how he made a comeback by finally dealing with his mental health. It's so riveting, you guys. But, you know, one of the things that I was reading that, Beth, you had written somewhere is that you thought this issue, because it is our military, people would come out and support the making of this documentary and throw a few pennies your way, whether they can afford 500 or $5 or more tax deductible, 401, 501, CK, whatever. Um, so I want people to know that they can go to strangeratthome.org and make a donation, you guys. I know we're all in tough times. Like, I get it. Believe me, my last gig was March 12, 2020. 2020, swear to God. Um, it's insane. But um, just support strangeratthome.org. And, you know, it, it, even if it's the price of a Starbucks coffee or a bottle of wine, you know, you can go one day and, and help somebody. I think it's a good, I want you to do that. Don't make me hate you. And you can support me by buying a Don't Make Me Hate You t-shirt on MaureenLangan.com. I would send you one. But listen, I wish you much continued success. Thank you for having me. This is um, this is not a, like I said, it's not a rom-com and, and it's a deep no. dive. It's a big picture, and you stayed on so much longer. The interest. Oh, in no, I'm interested. I want to help my brother um, is yeah. a Marine. You can't say was. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah. I'm from a military family, too. So, I I mean, I get it. I have two brothers that were West Point guys. and oh. So, yeah, I, I mean, we've all, we all know someone who's in the military. We just do. And you have to know that they've all, like, 
been part of this larger kind of trauma that we all kind of understand a little bit more because of COVID-19, you know, that stress, you take their experiences and you just pump it up by a hundred times and you, you know, but there's a relatability now. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's what's important. So um, yeah, we're doing this series, this live event series, just because the conversation's afoot, you know, mm -hmm. let's champion mental health for each other, for the military, for you know, for all of us, we're there. Oh, they're doing it for us. So the least we can do when they come back is support them. And this film is powerful. I can't wait for its full release. I've gotten to see clips and read a lot about it. Thank you. Um, you're doing good work, Missy. Thank you, you too. You okay, too. Beth, all the best to you. Thanks, Maureen. Okay, again, Champion Mental Health, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, the 31st, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, Stranger at Home, documentary. That's the Facebook page. Just go right there. And I see Saran Rothberg, Comedy Cures. She has a great organization. And I promise you, I'm supposed to get back to her. I promise you I'm going to have you on because you do such great work too. Uh, next Tuesday though, I have, I believe Michelle Ballin. She's a comic. She was on Last Comic Standing. Oh my God, I, I was on the ships. There was the virus, but I had good wine. I don't know what to do. So she'll be joining me and uh, she's so fun. But listen, you guys, do what you can, right? Just chuck a buck, for God's sakes. And I really am pleading with you to do that, uh, strangeratthome.org, if you want to support that. I mean, a, a documentary like this, should we should have a huge arts council, a huge, that says, let's, let's um, help Beth. And then once we run, when we have a little money left, we'll help Maureen. <laughs> um, Okay, so all of this will be on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and of course, of course, did I just say that? Oh, distribu distribution costs money. Just so you know, like you got to get this out. How do you get this out? Somebody just said that to me, and they're right, and I know who said it to me. Um, you have a couple more comments before I, I see you guys. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Sheila co-produced this, I believe, or was one of the producers on it. Uh, thank you for recommending the wonderful... Beth, and yes, Michelle Bell in the community. I think it's next Tuesday she's going to join me. Ah, yeah, Kai, let's talk about what's, what'd she say? Ballin, uh, kind of railing with Ballin. She, Michelle, what, what's driving her crazy? We're going to have some fun. Um, so follow Hanging with Lang on, on wherever you get your podcasts. Give it a good review. As you know, sometimes we're ridiculously silly here, and sometimes we're more serious because that's life, right? That's life. Uh, be safe, be good to each other. I think I have another message before we go. Thank you, Jenny, for introducing me. Yes, yeah, everybody knows everybody. It's so much fun. This like goes out everywhere. I get people from Ireland dropping in. I like that. Um, so you know the deal. Let me get my little sign until we meet it. Oh, I got to take that off. I'm very professional. All right. Um, until we meet again. Bye, wig. Mwah.